This conference has been progress. recorded. Cette conférence est enregistrée. Bonjour, bienvenue à cette conférence de presse. Hi, my name is Guillaume Saint-Pierre. I will be your moderator. Uh, with us today, uh, Jean-Yves Duclos, ministre de la Santé, uh, Ma Monsieur uh, Omar Al-Gaba, ministre des Transports, René Boissonneau, ministre du Tourisme. Donc, on va commencer avec uh, des déclarations de chacun des ministres et ensuite, on va prendre uh, des questions selon la formule habituelle. Um, so, Monsieur Duclos will be first. Uh, Allez-y, Monsieur Duclos. Merci, M. Saint-Pierre. Merci, uh, Guillaume. Et bonjour à tous. Good morning to everyone. Today, I am joined by Minister Algabra and Minister Boissonneau, as well as Dr. New, who is joining us also virtually. Aujourd'hui, je suis accompagné par le... Today, I'm accompanied by Minister Algabra and Minister Boissonneau, as well as Dr. New. They are all joining us virtually. Last week, on March 11th, we marked the second anniversary of the pandemic. It was a day to mourn those who have died from COVID-19, 37,000 people, to recognize those who have contracted the disease and those who continue to suffer its effects. And the fact that they're keeping, that they're continuing to suffer its effects. It was also a day to recognize and to thank the healthcare workers who have sacrificed so much and who have spent the last two years on the front lines to protect us. After two years of following individual public health measures, people in Canada know what to do to keep themselves and each other safe. As I've already mentioned in the past, we are in a much better position today than in 2020. High vaccination rates and strong adherence to public health measures have pushed us through the peak of the Omicron wave. We have more tools like widely available rapid tests and a range of new treatments that can help some patients from getting seriously ill. We can now say that we are in a transition phase and further to our February announcement, we can now announce other changes at the border. Starting April 1st, 2022, fully vaccinated people will no longer have to be required to complete a pre-entry test for travel to Canada as fully vaccinated travelers may still be selected to undergo random testing upon entry to Canada, but they will no longer be required to quarantine while awaiting their results. Unvaccinated and partially vaccinated travelers will continue to be tested with COVID-19 molecular tests on arrival and on day eight while they quarantine for 14 days. All travelers are also required to complete arrive can online or through the free mobile app before entry to Canada. Today's announcement is encouraging, but I will remind you, all measures are subject to review. We will continue to adjust them as the epidemiological situation evolves. I want to thank everyone in Canada for doing their part, getting vaccinated, and for many of you, for getting boosted. And you have followed border measures if you choose to travel and you followed local public health advice. Your cooperation is helping the country transition to the next phase of the pandemic. Living with COVID-19 means that we will continue to exercise that power and make prudent, smart choices for our communities and ourselves. Last week on March the 11th, we marked the second anniversary of the pandemic. That was a day to mourn those who have died from COVID-19 and to recognize those who have contracted the disease as well as those who continue to suffer its effects. It was also a day to recognize and thank the healthcare workers who have sacrificed so much over the last two years 
and spend that time on the front lines to protect all of us. After two years of following individual public health measures, Canadians know what to do to keep themselves and each other safe. As I've mentioned in the past, we are in a much better position now in March 2022 than we were in March 2020. High vaccination rates and strong adherence to public health measures have pushed us through the peak of the Omicron wave. We have more tools available now, like the wide availability of rapid tests and a range of new treatments that can help keep some patients from getting seriously ill. I think it's fair to say that we are now entering into a transition phase of this pandemic. As the weather warms and people spend more time outside, we can expect to see transmission decline in the coming months, but we have to be prepared for a waning of collective and individual immunity. Of course, the government of Canada will also keep monitoring for new variants through our robust surveillance system and adjust public health measures as necessary. In the meantime, and to build our, on our last announcement in February, we are now ready to announce further changes to border measures. Effective April 1st, 2022, fully vaccinated travelers will no longer be required to complete a pre-entry test for travel to Canada. Fully vaccinated travelers may still, may still continue to undergo random testing upon entry to Canada, but they are no longer required to quarantine while awaiting their results. Unvaccinated and partially vaccinated travelers will continue to be tested with COVID-19 molecular tests on arrival and on day eight while they quarantine for 14 days. All travelers are also required to complete ArriveScan online or through the free mobile app before entry to Canada. Today's announcement is encouraging, but let us remember that all measures are subject to review. We will continue to adjust them as the epidemiological situation here in Canada and abroad evolves. Finally, I would like to thank Canadians for doing their part, getting vaccinated, and for many of you getting boosted and following public health advice. We have the power individually and collectively to reduce the impact of the virus on our lives. Living with COVID-19 means that we want to continue to exercise that power and make prudent, smart choices for ourselves and for those we love. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to Minister Algabra. Merci, uh, Janiv. Uh, bonjour. Thank you, Janiv, and good morning to everyone. I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today is a day that many of us have been waiting for. It is a great day for Canadian travelers, tourism, and aviation. Saison de bonnes nouvelles. This is good news. All along, that we would adjust our border measures based on public health recommendations. And that is exactly what we are doing today. I also want to highlight what removing pre-entry testing will mean for cruise ship travelers when the season starts in early April. Passengers on a cruise uh, will need to take an antigen test no more than one day before the scheduled departure, but will no longer be required to be tested before getting off the cruise ship. All other aspects of the public health framework for cruises that I announced last week in Halifax, such as the requirement to be vaccinated in order to board, will remain in place. As Minister Duclo noted, the revised border measures we're announcing today are possible thanks to the millions of Canadians who have stepped up, rolled up their sleeves, and gotten vaccinated. Merci à vous tous. Thank you to all that the health and safety of Canadians remains a priority and we will still have the necessary safety measures in place for travelers. La santé et la sécurité des Canadiens. Health and the safety of Canadians are our priority. 
Our government is investing in Canada's airports to support testing and screening for COVID-19 to make the travel experience as safe and as convenient as possible. And just last Monday, I announced a major investment at Pearson Airport and more announcements are coming. We also continue to have measures such as the obligation to be vaccinated to take a plane or a train in Canada and wearing a mask in Canadian airports and on planes. But as we've always said, public health measures are temporary and we will adjust them based on public health recommendations. And as we move to this next step, I want to thank our airlines, airports, tourism operators, travelers, and all workers in the air sector and cruise industry for their tireless work over the past two years. It has not been easy, but all of them have stepped up. And now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Minister Boissonneau. Thank you very much. Merci. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Algabra, Minister Duclo, Dr. Arnoux. Quel plaisir d'être ici avec uh, What a pleasure to be with you here today for this big announcement. I want to acknowledge that today I'm joining you from uh, Calgary and from the lands of Treaty 7 peoples, the territorial lands of people who make Treaty 7 their home. There's no denying that the tourism sector has been uniquely affected uh, throughout the pandemic. And as many of you know, in the, in the past few months, I've heard from and met so many inspiring entrepreneurs, organizations and businesses in Canada's tourism sector who worked hard to keep their operations afloat, to reinvent themselves and to continue to find creative ways to get through this global pandemic. And since becoming Minister of Tourism, I've heard their concerns. I've also seen resilience and an innovative spirit that has been inspiring for all of us. I can't help but thinking of uh, tourism entrepreneurs like Tina Dixon from Whitehorse who told me recently that she just wanted to get back to work. It's been way too long of a break. To Tina and all the incredible people who make up our sector, you should all be proud of what you've managed to accomplish during these difficult times. And today's announcement has been eagerly anticipated by Canada's tourism industry. My friends, the time has finally come. Today, we announce the lifting of testing requirements for fully vaccinated travelers. Canada's tourism sector is ready to ensure the safety of travelers, employers, and the communities in which they operate. They are ready to welcome back the world. As you know, the government of Canada is deeply invested in seeing our sector, the tourism sector, thrive once again. Budget 2021 introduced a three-year, $1 billion commitment to the sector. We have had your backs committing more than $15 billion in total support to the tourism, arts, and culture sectors through this pandemic. And this includes the $500 million tourism relief fund, which was created to help tourism businesses and operators adapt to our new reality while setting the stage for future growth. Since December, we've rolled out an additional $12 billion in support. We did this because we know that the Canadian economy will not fully recover until our tourism sector recovers too. And that recovery is now at hand. With the reduction in travel restrictions announced today, notably removing the requirement for fully vaccinated travelers to submit a pre-entry COVID-19 test result, we are making it easier for people from around the world to visit Canada this spring and beyond. And they will come. With our high vaccination rates and our focus on health and safety, Canada has a huge advantage in attracting visitors because they know it's safe to travel to Canada. We know the best way to overcome the extraordinary challenges of the last two years is by coming together in a spirit of partnership and collaboration across all levels of government and with the sector. We know that the best way to overcome the obstacles of the last two years is to work together at all government levels and within the tourist industry. For this reason, we are removing COVID-19 restriction for fully vaccinated people today. I'd like to turn to Canadians. Our purpose in setting the table for the next summer season, the festival season, and vacations is ready. Vibrant cities and cultural and historic treasures, and they want to come back for more. And I think of my recent visits, one to the Indigenous Peoples Experience in Fort Edmonton Park, and one on a guided tour of Stanley Park with Candace from Talese Tours. And these experiences can offer a glimpse 
into the rich diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis culture from coast to coast to coast. Indigenous tourism is reconciliation in action. I think of how Canada has been named a top destination for LGBTQ2 travelers who are drawn in part because of Canada's hallmark safety and security, but there's more to it. We are an inclusive and caring society. I think about our strong appeal for those seeking a francophone language and cultural experience. Je pense également de notre fort attrait pour ceux qui recherchent une expérience linguistique. And for those who are looking for a francophone experience, here we are. While you're focusing on kickstarting a comeback, the whole of our government is there, shoulder to shoulder with you. We will lead, we will engage, and we will inspire. I've said it on numerous occasions, safety first, then travel. With the changes announced today, I say to everyone around the world, make Canada your next trip. We have it all. Beautiful, breathtaking landscapes, internationally acclaimed festivals, premier national parks and outdoor recreation, diverse options from Northern Peaks to our downtown cores. And first and foremost, safety. Venez vous en, come experience it for yourself. Merci, thank you, hi hi. And now moderator, over to you. Oui, merci, euh, merci, monsieur. Um, donc, on va prendre des questions. Thank you. We'll take questions now. Five minutes for questions. We have a hard stop at 11.30. Uh, just a reminder to mute yourself between your question and your follow-up. Uh, so we will start with uh, Kevin Gallagher, CTV News. Good morning. My question is for uh, Minister Duclos. Um, you know, specifically when it comes to vaccine mandates for passengers on planes and trains, I mean, obviously this is still in effect. I think the question really is, um, we know that through waning immunity and also um, the vaccine's effectiveness on the Omicron variant, that the, it, two shots is simply less effective and not nearly as effective as it was. So, you know, uh, the federal government, it seems, does have a choice now. Um, will the vaccine mandate remain for travelers on planes and trains, or will fully vaccinated, as a definition, have to incorporate three shots? So what, what decision do you think the federal government will make? Well, thank you, uh, Kevin. Those are very good questions. And uh, let me answer in three uh, different ways. First, uh, as we know, to the announcement today is around you know, pre-entry testing rules for vaccinated travelers that uh, doesn't impact the rules around unvaccinated travelers. Second, the vaccination rules for entering into Canada are rules that are decided in obviously based on the uh, advice and the insights of public health officials. We're also working with international partners because obviously when planes uh, travel in both directions, so we, we, we are working with international partners on establishing uh, those rules, as you said, based on the, uh, what we know from an epidemiological uh, perspective, but also from a virological uh, perspective. So you are correct also uh, in alluding to the fact that booster doses are uh, is a, is a consensus that booster doses are needed, a, a three-dose uh, regime is a primary series regime uh, that most experts agree to. And finally, uh, I, I would point that to the fact that uh, that all obviously depends on the evolution of possible things on which we have little uh, evidence and also certainly no control, which is the, the arrival of possibly of possible new variants or future waves. So all of this is based, all of these decisions today are based on the current um, uh, measure of the situation on prudence, on precaution, but also on the, the, the knowledge and the acknowledgement that these will continue to be uh, addressed and, and possibly evolved. Um, so, will you change the qualification for fully vaccinated? You know, does fully vaccinated, uh, will that soon mean you need to have Three doses. You need to have that booster shot. Is that going to be? Is that going to meet the definition of fully vaccinated for the Canadian government? Well, a, there is no change to the definition of a fully uh, vaccinated uh, Canadian. B, you are correct in saying that we should keep encouraging Canadians to get a booster dose. 
uh, as a as a, a a way to broaden and secure their protection against uh, uh, against the virus. And see, it is true that in other countries they are uh, contemplating that. Uh, you, if if you look at uh, Fran France and and Denmark, for instance, you'll see that a, a third dose is included in their definition of, of of fully vaccinated people. But that's their their decision, and we are making our own decisions in Canada. Olivier Ferrand Boissy, t'es bien? Good morning. Mr. Duclos, we have seen a, a surge in cases, particularly in South Korea. We have seen climbing COVID cases in the provinces. Does that concern you at all? Are you going to contemplate uh, introducing additional measures here in Canada? First of all, let's be clear, everyone has understood that COVID-19 is a virus that changes, so do the variants. And as we are all we say, and as we are saying today, the measures can evolve. The second thing is that in Canada, we have, uh, we are lucky that we have uh, come through this much better than a lot of other countries. And it's important to remember also that here in Canada, we efficiently vaccinated millions of Canadians and among those who were vaccinated uh, twice, I think we have we have a rate of uh, over 81 percent, and and a lot of Canadians have got a booster dose as well. So we know, or we're hoping, that in a few weeks we will we'll be protected individually and collectively. So nothing has been won yet with respect to COVID-19. COVID will continue to be with us for a very long time, but in Canada, we have come through it quite well now. And with our immunity rate in the country, uh, I think that we will do very well over the next few weeks and months. We've heard that the WHO uh, may not be purchasing uh, the Quebec vaccine because of the Philip Morris incident. What do you think of that? What do you think of this opportunity? And what impact will this have on the management of vaccines in Canada? Will it have an impact on the COVAX? Uh, what do you think? Very well. So two very good things about uh, Medicago. First of all, as everyone probably knows, this is a Canadian company one of the rare Canadian companies that over the past few months have been able to develop and now produce a Canadian vaccine. We can all be very proud of this, given that we found out that during the start of COVID-19 that our pharmaceutical capacity had declined seriously over the past few years. The second good piece of news with respect to Medico is that it's a vaccine it's the first uh, vac Canadian vaccination that has been approved by Health Canada. But in addition, this is uh, a vaccine that's used new technology. And this could be broadened to d cover other types of uh, diseases. And it will... Th and there's other vaccines that it would would uh, be involved as well. So this is a new technology that will complete the technology provided by other types of vaccines. Obviously, we're following this work uh, and we're following WHO closely. Uh, we're looking at the exchanges between WHO and Medico. Minister Champagne and I have contacted Medico to make sure that its uh, contact with uh, WHO is done properly and so that everyone, not only here in Canada, but elsewhere in the world can take advantage of this uh, new uh, vaccination that has been approved by uh, Health Canada. 
and it can be good for a lot of other humans living elsewhere on the planet. Ryan Tumulty, Post Media. Yeah, hi there. Um, this question is, I guess, probably for Dr. New. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, since we are, you know, opening up to the world a little bit more here again, I wonder if you can talk about improvements to sort of international disease surveillance that we might have made over the last two years. Uh, I'm thinking of GFIN, but, you know, more broadly, are we better positioned to be able to see outbreaks happening some other part of the world? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, it's Dr. New, and uh, yes, I can say that uh, certainly uh, uh, there's been a lot of lessons learned over the past two years, and amongst them, obviously, in terms of uh, continuing, uh, continually uh, improving, enhancing our surveillance systems, not just here at home, but also in terms of collaboration with uh, with partners around the world. Uh, as you can see, where we're continually uh, uh, looking at what the experience has been in other countries in terms of, you know, their epidemic curves, uh, what their experience has been with various variants, uh, how their vaccine rollout has has progressed, and, uh, and how that's uh, sort of affected uh, their epidemic uh, situation. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, that that's something I think we'll just uh, continue to build on. So I would say that the short answer to your question, say yes. Uh, I think overall surveillance systems uh, across the world, but also the interconnectedness of surveillance systems uh, certainly has improved over the past two years. And then just following up on that, um, are you looking to, to set up a system maybe where we would examine specific countries and might invoke specific national travel bans in future if we saw, I know there's a couple places in the world that have seen particularly high COVID rates in the last few weeks. That's a difficult question because uh, certainly as we uh, look at the, the data that comes out of the various countries, we recognize that, you know, uh, uh, not all countries may have the capacity to be uh, reporting uh, as accurately uh, compared to other countries. And we certainly don't want to, uh, you know, uh, penalize uh, specific countries for their ability to, to uh, be able to, to report more rapidly. I think uh, the recent experience with uh, South Africa, and, and I think kudos again to them for uh, being among the first to detect uh, the Omicron variant, I think uh, uh, bears a sort of a, a sort of a lesson learned there in terms of how we could or should be reacting as the world. So I would say that uh, I think we're, we're all in it together, I think in terms of uh, worldwide surveillance systems, and I think it's not really uh, sort of aimed at uh, picking out specific countries, but that, that we all need to be working together to strengthen or be able to detect uh, uh, new variants that, that come along and then be able to, as they say, uh, in, a, in, a, in a prudent fashion, uh, react in, in an appropriate fashion across the world and not, uh, as they say, focus on specific countries. My question is for Minister Duclos. Mr. Duclos, I'd like to go back to Kevin Gallagher's question. You said that the third dose was now part of the regular vaccine regime. So I'd like to know, what does it give to maintain this um, vaccination requirement at two doses when we know that it doesn't provide adequate uh, coverages? Two doses, we know it doesn't do that much. Thank you, Ellen. And I'd like to rectify something. Two doses, it's much better than zero doses. Yes, two doses doesn't protect perfectly against COVID-19, but there's no vaccine that uh, protects people against uh, disease uh, 100%. So two doses does continue to afford good protection. It didn't do so well with the Omicron variant, but it does provide protection. I think 70% is the protection rate that now the this is the, the rate that's used for uh, determining the effect, efficacy of vaccines for other diseases. So two doses does continue according, well, depending on the person, but does continue to provide good protection. It, it also depends on the, the amount of time elapsed between the first and second dose, but it's not as good as a third dose. And that's why we're encouraging all those who are listening to us to go and get their booster dose if it's not if it hasn't already been done. But Minister Duclos, why maintain this vaccine obligation? And I'm talking here about travelers, obviously, but also federal public uh, employees who have had to get a vaccination. 
I could see that the things, these restrictions are dropping off in other provinces. Do you have any attention to abandon this vaccine obligation? In as I said earlier, all of the measures are subject to review, and we will continue to review these measures based on what we learn. We see that there's a waning off of effect efficacy in time. We know that post-infection immunity accounts for something, and we think that there will be probably a new variant that will surface. We don't know how it will present itself, but all the measures will be reviewed. But the message I want to say, the main message I want to convey is two doses is better than nothing. And we, we, we need to have mandatory vaccination at present. Free press. Hi, thanks for taking your questions. Uh, a question for Minister Duclos about the reporting of COVID that you're expecting to keep in place. Uh, Manitoba has said that it will report COVID similar to influenza, which means news, uh, uh, you know, weekly reports on hospitalizations and severity, but not the actual number of cases unless they end up in hospital. Does VAC have a plan for what types of data it will keep requesting from provinces and what will Ottawa's reporting look like going forward? Uh, thank you, uh, Dylan, for uh, many different and, and good questions. I'll try to answer them as concisely and as fairly as possible. First, on provinces and territories, as we no, I think after two years of the pandemic, each province and each territory makes its own decisions based on the local context uh, and the local public health advice. Uh, the second, you are correct in signaling the fact that we not only do we know uh, less about COVID-19 than we would have, say, just a few months ago because of the uh, lower uh, accessibility, availability of PCR testing. But we also know that this epidemiological situation will keep changing with, with, uh, with new variants and new waves. So fewer uh, uh, tools using the traditional PCR molecular tests, but a need, a continuing need to keep monitoring the situation. Fortunately, uh, PHAC has made significant advances in, using, in the use, for instance, of wastewater data. I look forward to uh, to PHAC uh, in the near uh, future, uh, more reporting to you uh, as journalists and possibly others on the on the usefulness uh, and the key usefulness of that uh, additional source of information on the epidemiology of COVID-19 in Canada. In addition to what you have, you have would have noted that uh, when travelers enter Canada, there is a random a selection of them, a PCR test is uh, is 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 the, is uh, off, is applied to them, so they go through a PCR test randomly, and that gives us information, you know, very 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 strong and useful information on the size of of uh, the population that enters into Canada with different variants, where they come from. So it complements all of the other uh, surveillance methods that Doctor New alluded to uh, earlier. So I would say that um, different governments do different things. At the federal level, we are uh, using uh, further tools to keep monitoring and therefore fighting the virus. Thank you. And uh, for my follow-up, I just wanted to, to ask, uh, I think the medical officers of health will have to discuss how they anticipate reporting going forward. But I'm just wondering, in terms of the, the types of material that we see come through the Flu Watch program, you know, uh, we're talking about the hospitalizations, we're talking about how many severe cases there are. Uh, at this point, do you have any sort of an indication of of what we might actually want to expect, you know, as these restrictions ease in terms of what type of surveillance of the virus will continue over the coming months? Well, for that, uh, great question. Maybe uh, we should turn to Dr. New. Uh, Dr. New, would you like to explain uh, how PHAC is 
working in this uh, new environment, connecting different types of data and to support the monitoring made and by provinces and territories? Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question, uh, Dylan. It, it's a Dr. New here, and you're right. Uh, uh, we continue at the federal level, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada, working closely with our counterparts in the provinces and territories. And what we're looking towards is, is, is as you say, uh, uh, having a more of a, quote, an integrated surveillance system. So it's a, it's a number of different initiatives. As uh, Minister Duclos mentioned, uh, uh, certainly a, a very new and innovative tool is the wastewater surveillance, which can sometimes give us an early signal in terms of what a community might expect in terms of maybe a, a subsequent increase in the actual uh, number of cases of infection among among uh, its citizens. And then obviously as control measures are put in place, the wastewater surveillance is also a, a tool to be able to monitor the effect of uh, effectiveness of those control measures as hopefully, uh, you know, the, uh, the sort of the indications or indicator uh, indicators of wastewater surveillance uh, hopefully go down. So uh, that that's one uh, initial uh, new tool that we're also uh, expanding right now. I think it's about 60% coverage uh, across uh, sort of uh, municipalities and so on in Canada. We're hopefully uh, trying to increase that to 80% and, and, and even more in the future. So that's one tool. Uh, for respect, uh, with respect to the uh, severity indicators, uh, certainly we're, we're expecting to continue receiving uh, on, a, on a regular basis from the province and territories hospitalization data and other uh, severity indicators, including deaths to, to, to show us uh, uh, what might be happening with respect to, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, let's say uh, COVID-19 general, but obviously maybe the impact of, uh, of a specific variance. And of course, besides the severity indicators, our ongoing uh, monitoring in terms of uh, actual infections continues uh, with the provinces and territories. For example, uh, as you pointed out, it may not necessarily be a, a case of having to detect every single case, but maybe more towards what we're doing for our flu surveillance, as you pointed out, uh, having sentinel sites uh, like, like flu watchers, looking at other indicators like maybe absenteeism rates, you know, in schools and workplaces. And then, of course, it's important to uh, continuously uh, on a regular basis sample and actually do the genetic sequencing of, of uh, uh, individual cases to be able to monitor uh, uh, what, what might be happening with a, a shifting uh, sort of mixture of, uh, of variants in the country. And as the minister pointed out, on top of that, we'll have our border uh, surveillance to be able to uh, detect uh, uh, potentially the emergence of new variants uh, around the world uh, with respect to travelers coming into the into the country. So uh, it is all encompassing and uh, there's lots of lots of work underway, as they say, behind the scenes. Uh, another thing I might mention is that we're also leveraging our existing uh, Sentinel sites, uh, for example, in hospitals, we have a, uh, a, a sentinel system with uh, some key hospitals are also able to give us some uh, key uh, uh, data that uh, we might need uh, moving forward. So I think I'll leave it at that and uh, certainly uh, happy to uh, maybe get into more detail, maybe in a, in a, in a future presser that Dr. Tem and I will uh, be giving. My question is for Dr. New. Is is it a public health uh, recommendation that uh, vaccinated people uh, do not have to have these requirements anymore? Thank you very much for your question. With the policy that is currently in effect at the border, it's important as a principle to that we continue to comply with the policy on vaccinated Travelers, we know that this is a very important tool. It's a key tool. And for travelers who arrive here in Canada and for the entire population. But if if but if you want to look at the number of vaccinations, well that gets interesting because we're we talk about being up to date with the vaccinations rather than looking at the number of doses of vaccination. For instance, we know that it's not just the number of vaccine doses that's important, but the interval between the doses, because we know that in some countries, people may have received two, three, or even four doses, but if the doses are not given, given at an interval like the one we have here in Canada, perhaps the humidity is not as robust as it may be here in Canada because here we have an interval, uh, a longer interval between doses. 
eight weeks is what uh, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization recommended. And, and we and now we're talking about getting a booster six months later. Here in Canada, what's happening at the border is we know that a transition is occurring. There are a lot of travelers arriving here in Canada from other countries that are not as lucky as Canada. And we 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 have to accept the other vaccinations recommended by the WHO. That's something that we're following. We're looking at the data. And so we continue to look at uh, conclusive data, but for the instant, for the instant, it's clear that Minister Duclos will continue to look at what's happening in other countries. We'll look at the data and we will adjust our policy uh, accordingly. Thank you. I heard what you had to say, but have you recommended the current uh, two-dose uh, formula or will you be calculating uh, another type of formula? We know that with the, vac the number of vaccinations recommended in Canada, we know that, that in order to have a stronger protection, we know that after uh, that immunity from a vaccination starts to decline after six months. So we have been talking about the need for booster doses for eligible people here in Canada. For those who have received their dose uh, more than six months ago, but for travelers, there are other considerations that we have to take into account. To date, we accept two doses, but obviously we are going to look at the data and we will take all of this data into account and provide our recommendations to the minister here in Canada. But for the time being, this is, uh, this is what the case is. So 10 minutes remaining. But a few uh, reporters that have questions, so just uh, if we can keep our, our uh, answers short, it would be great. Uh, Olivia Stefanovic, uh, CBC. Thank you. Good morning. You're making this announcement at a time when the WHO is warning about the spread of COVID-19, particularly the BA2 variant worldwide. So I'm wondering, is this really the right time to be making these changes? And how prepared are you to rule these changes back if there is a spike in cases across the country? Well, thank you, uh, Olivia, for that uh, great question. Well, as you will have heard, the, we we have well, and we will have seen over the last months. We keep following the situation and change and adjust the rules as required, taking into account both the domestic and the international situation. Over the last few weeks, just to give you uh, perhaps some 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 numbers. Over the last few weeks, we've seen a significant decrease in the rates of positivity of travelers entering into Canada. That rate was almost 10% in, in January, that, which means that uh, one out of 10 travelers in January uh, entering into Canada was positive with COVID. That was significantly larger, obviously, than what we had seen in December, early in December and prior to that. That rate has fallen to about 1% now. So no, they are, they, there, is a, there is obviously alignment between that rate and what we see internally in Canada and outside of Canada. That's this being said, you are entirely correct. In the world, according to the uh, WHO, there is an increase in um, the overall global number of cases, uh, most like most uh, importantly in some regions of Asia and some parts of Europe. So we are going to keep monitoring the situation. As, as Dr. New mentioned earlier, we are going to use uh, MRT, mandatory random testing to do that on a region country specific basis. And if we see that we need to adjust measures, we will obviously do that because as Randy and, and Omar also mentioned, 
we are mindful of the importance of focusing on the health and safety of everyone. How much longer do you expect travelers to be required to wear masks on planes and trains? Maybe I should turn to uh, Minister Agabra for that question. Uh, thank you, Janiv. Uh, um, so, look, the uh, we're, we'll continue to rely on the advice that we receive from our public health. Uh, and we will adjust our measures uh, as as the situation evolves. But we are also just like we will ease our measures if things uh, appear to be um, um, evolving in a negative direction. We will also have to adjust our measures accordingly. So we just need to be nimble, maintaining uh, uh, that we're protecting the public uh, health and safety of Canadians. And, and and I agree, obviously, and and and, and Omar, maybe I should, uh, Minister Gabra, I should, I should have pointed to Doctor New uh, as well, because you now wearing a mask is is something that uh, uh, comes with uh, obviously some inconvenience. You no, know, individually, we'd all prefer not to wear a mask uh, uh, for, for all sorts of obvious reasons. But you know, the, the health benefits of wearing a mask, in particularly in crowded areas like a plane or train that are also uh, well known. So um, uh, I'm going to turn back to you, uh, Guillaume, because uh, I know time is too short. Yeah. This is Dr. New, I was just going to mention, uh, just from a public health perspective, uh, certainly uh, the use of face masks is a, a personal protective measure. It's another layer of protection that we certainly would recommend. And certainly in the context of uh, being as, as Minister Duclos and Mr. Algabra said, if you're in an enclosed space, like say uh, an airplane, uh, you know, for an extended period of time, I, I think it just makes sense that we've always talked about uh, avoiding the three C's or at least being being careful what you do in the three C's, you know, you have crowded, closed uh, spaces with close contact. So I think uh, at a personal level, I would certainly think, you know, it doesn't matter if there's a mandate or not. I think it's just a good practice to uh, keep wearing a face mask in, in, in certain contexts. Thank you. Raphael Pirot, Agence Cuevi. Good morning. My question is for Minister Algalbra. I'd like to understand the process when the Belarus, Russian, or Russian planes cross Canadian skies. Could you provide some clarification? What is the process? And is it the Department of Transport? that manages the situation, or is it now in the hands of the Minister of Defence? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, look, from the beginning, we've been um, outlining comprehensive measures um, uh, to uh, respond to the unprovoked attack by Russia on Ukraine. And we've expressed our solidarity with Ukraine and the Ukrainian people in this moment of, of, of need. Uh, part of our measures have uh, been back to ban Russian flights from Canadian airspace and Russian boats from Canadian air, uh, Canadian uh, waters. And we've now um, accelerated or expanded these measures to include uh, Belarusian uh, uh, planes. Uh, so these, the, this uh, NOTAM is done under a NOTAM notice to airmen uh, mechanism where we issue uh, 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 an advice or a warning to to uh, air operators that if they uh, if, if they feel if they are part of the uh, of those measures they need to they must avoid Canadian airspace and NAV Canada the air traffic control body uh, uh, is uh, responsible for enforcing that so they're uh, uh, so operators and pilots are notified before getting close to. Uh, uh, to Canadian airspace that if uh, if there are a Russian-owned or chartered plane or if there are Belarusian-owned or chartered plane, they are not allowed to enter Canadian airspace. Okay, merci. Thank you. Mr. Duclos, earlier, We talked about what it means to be adequately vaccinated. Foreigners who are not vaccinated with uh, Canadian-approved vaccinations are not considered as being uh, fully vaccinated. Is that something that you are going to change eventually? And do we know 
how many people cannot enter Canada because of that reason. Thank you, Mr. Pierrot. There are a few exceptions, which I'm not going to enumerate because I'm sure to miss a few, but there are exemptions for uh, foreign uh, temporary workers. A small percentage of them are not vaccinated, but they can enter uh, Canada providing the quarantine for 14 days. But generally speaking, you're quite right. You have to be vaccinated to come into Canada as a general rule. A lot of countries, uh, well, a lot of people who want to visit us and they have high vaccination rates, sometimes even uh, they come from countries with a higher vaccinate rate as than Canada. So the fact that So, very few people are excluded. We have time for one final question. People still with the with their hands up. Uh, maybe you guys can share a uh, a, a question and a follow up. So we would go to Valérie Gamache and then uh, uh, maybe Global News. Um, go ahead. Oui, bonjour. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. I'd like to go back to Minister Duclos about Medicago. What impact will this have on COVAX? And what impact will it have with respect to WHO? First of all, perhaps I didn't say it clearly enough, but the decision um, made by WHO has not been taken yet. And we want to ensure with Medicago that the information is shared between the two organizations. All of this is underway. And what I did say, and I'm happy to repeat this, Medicago is good for Canada and Canadians, but it's also good for, for other countries because this is the uh, unique type of technology and it will strengthen the range of, of, of technologies used to produce vaccinations throughout the world. It's a really good piece of news that this is a Canadian company and it will really do a lot for our pharmaceutical sector and it's very good for the future in vaccinating people against COVID. I do understand, but WHO has clear rules. It's it says that cigarettes are the biggest killers of the world, and but getting f f vaccinations that are being paid for by cigarette producers, that's, are you trying to get around the rules? Uh, so what's the story there? We are ensuring that WHO has all the information that Medico has, and also the Health Canada is a, a, one of the regulatory bodies in the world that has a very solid reputation. So if Health Canada approves a vaccination, that will really help the vaccination get approved elsewhere. So Health Canada's approval is sending a very clear signal and so WHO will have to look at this information and all other available information in order to make a decision. Time that we have. Um, I'm sorry that uh, for the reporters that are still uh, on, on the line. Uh, thank you, ministers. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. C'est une excellente journée.